Specialty Story, session number 58. Whether you are a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you'll want to practice. This podcast will tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information you need to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. Welcome to Specialty Stories. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, your host here every week. If you are new here, thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode all about movement disorders from a neurologist. If you're new, don't forget to subscribe. You can subscribe on an iOS device through the podcast app, on an Android device through Google Play Music or through a third-party app like Podcast Attic, which is what I recommend. Or if you're a Spotify user, relatively recently, all of the Meded Media podcasts are now in Spotify. So you don't have to leave your music app to go listen to hopefully what you think are great podcasts from Meded Media. Today, we're going to talk to a neurologist who is a movement disorder specialist. We're going to talk all about why she chose her career, what it takes to become a movement disorder specialist, what sorts of diseases she treats, what sort of patients she treats, what she likes about it, and what she doesn't. So let's dive in and say hello to Dr. Catherine Lefebvre, who is an academic movement disorder specialist. Now, over four years out of training. We start the discussion by talking about what initially drew Catherine to movement disorder medicine. So um, I was a, a neurology resident, uh, actually trained at Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, I had the opportunity to shadow or do an elective in movement disorders with um, a great, uh, great mentor, Dr. Eric Alscock. Uh, and I just got really fascinated by it pretty much from day one. I just fell in love with just how he was treating his patients, kind of a really personal connections he formed. And I just kind of pretty much day one, decided this is what I want to do. So what I really love about movement disorders is um, you really see kind of with your own eyes the problem, you know, in front of you. So, for example, with Parkinson, people have too little movement, right? And you can often make a diagnosis almost as you come in the room. Uh, on the other hand, you have people with too much movement. So you have someone with chorea, like Huntington's chorea. And again, you see this pretty much you can really describe and see what is uh, going going on, what's maybe going wrong, and and kind of make your uh, make your um, conclusions pretty much uh, from uh, just observing the, the patient. And I find that really fascinating. And it's it's just uh, to me, it's a really interesting specialty. A lot of uh, treatments available, and really the opportunity to follow people uh, long term, often over you know almost a lifetime and uh, really help them a lot to live the best life possible. So it's a lot of things uh, that really attracted me to that subspecialty. Were there any other neuro subspecialties that you were drawn to? Yeah, I think I think for many um, well, medical students, as you kind of rotate through the different uh, uh, fields and, and then also within a, a specialty like neurology, you know, I think it's pretty natural to kind of whatever you do to really sort of get drawn to and, and really uh, explore it and and, and find a, sort of a positive. So, so yeah, I, I really, um, I think I always sort of enjoyed what I was doing. I really um, got fascinated by reading EGs and doing EMGs and learning to listen to the muscle and kind of in real time. And I just kind of thought it was really fascinating. Uh, but yeah, just, uh, I think I just um, really enjoyed the connection to the patients with movement disorders. And uh, and then also the, the fact that there are so many treatment options available, because that's not always the case in neurology. Um, fortunately, we, we are really in very exciting times. So for, for many treatments, there's more and more treatments available. But with movement disorders, you know, the Parkinson's levodopa was um, developed or uh, kind of discovered in the 1960s. And uh, to this day actually remains the mainstay for treatment in Parkinson's disease. Uh, so we've been able for a very long time to uh, really help patients and make a significant difference uh, in their disease uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, so, so I think that's very, um, uh, very exciting, uh, always exciting for physicians, right? When you have... Uh, 
sort of treatments that really work and really um, improve someone's quality of life. And that that is not the norm in neurology, so that's good. <laughs> what yeah. traits What traits do you think lead to being a good movement disorder specialist? Well, so um, as I sort of mentioned, the, the, the really the mainstay of uh, seeing people with movement disorders is uh, really good observation skills and uh, uh, not only seeing the movements, but then trying to um, kind of find the pattern, right? So uh, fitting them in the right category. And after you've done it for a while, you know, it seems pretty natural to, to see, oh, this is a tremor or this is myoclonus or this is uh, ataxia. Uh, but um, when you, you know, see patients referred from primary care doctors, you kind of realize, well, you know, that's not so obvious for someone who's uh, not specifically trained in this and uh, really kind of teasing these differences out and, and then uh, coming to the correct diagnosis and finding the correct treatment. I think it's pretty satisfying. So, so yeah, I think good observational skills, uh, sort of enjoying sort of uh, logic thinking and you know, classifications and, and trying to uh, kind of, it's almost like a puzzle, right? You take uh, the history, you do your exam, and, and it's all kind of fitting, fitting uh, kind of clues together. Uh, but um, yeah, so um, some of these skills, I think, are, are pretty common in most neurologists, probably. Describe the types of patients, diseases that you're seeing on a day-to-day basis. So when we say movement disorders, uh, probably the mainstay for most people in practice is Parkinson's disease. Uh, And that being said, Parkinson's disease is on the rise. Uh, Along with Alzheimer's disease, it's unfortunately affecting uh, more and more uh, people. I just read a statistic, one in 37 patients is actually expected to have Parkinson's disease. So it's actually very common uh, disease. So whether you do neurology or not, you're going to see uh, people with Parkinson's disease and, you know, uh, other areas in medicine as well. Um, so Parkinson's disease is, uh, is you know, not one disease. I mean, it can affect uh, young people, so young onset uh, Parkinson's disease or, or later in life, and it can uh, be pretty variable. And uh, so there's many, many different uh, treatments, not only medication, but non-medical treatments. It also affects not only the motor symptom, but also uh, sleep and mood and autonomic symptoms. Uh, so it's, it's pretty um, interesting area to, to be active in and, and still lots of things uh, to be researched on and discovered. So, so it's, it's definitely a very interesting field. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, um, other common movement disorders. Uh, so it really kind of spans the whole spectrum from age ranges. Uh, so I typically don't see uh, children, but I sometimes do see teenagers. Uh, so we have some uh, dystonia, so genetic forms of dystonia or tics, Tourette syndrome uh, that often affect children and teenagers. Uh, then younger adults, um, tremor can can uh, be present in, in younger adults. Uh, then chorea, like Huntington's disease, so genetic forms of movement disorders often present in, in midlife. And certainly uh, other forms of dystonia, so people with uh, cervical dystonia and usually present in, in midlife. Uh, and uh, and then uh, later in life, so uh, besides Parkinson's, essential tremor is also extremely common and uh, very um, can have uh, very satisfying treatment results of medication or even with uh, deep brain stimulation surgery. For a student who loves the the hunt and putting all those pieces together, there are some specialties where patients come already diagnosed and you just figure out treatments in your job on a day-to-day basis as a movement disorder doc, how many patients are coming to you because they need a diagnosis or how many are coming to you with the diagnosis already? Well, it often is surprising uh, because many people do in fact get misdiagnosed. Uh, So although essential tremor and Parkinson's disease are so common and, you know, they're, um, Parkinson's disease, sort of a classic teaching as well as this arresting tremor, essential tremor, postural tremor. So in a typical presentation, it's it's fairly easy to tell the two apart, but um, it's not not always, not everyone behaves like the textbook uh, says, so it's not always as easy. And people surprisingly often do get misdiagnosed, either by a primary care physician or even by a neurologist who might not be um, maybe very well-trained in movement disorders per se. Uh, so 
you know, I would say uh, for patients who get a new referral uh, for a specialist, I guess it depends a little bit on your setting of practice. But um, like myself, I'm in a tertiary um, academic center. We, we often do get uh, patients where we really have to, um, you know, really dig a little bit deeper and uh, put, put the look for the missing puzzle clues to, to really get to the diagnosis. Uh, so, so it all depends. But, uh, but we definitely, I would say I do have challenging cases every week where uh, you really have to um, be, you know, pretty thorough with your history and your examination to really uh, get to the diagnosis or even uh, get some help from additional testing, genetic testing even, or imaging testing to, to reach the diagnosis. You talked about the, the setting that you're in, in a tertiary academic setting. What was your decision for going into academic versus going into the community to private practice? Well, so so what I was uh, drawn to neurology was really exploring. Uh, so I was always very interested in, in sort of human psychology and what makes us do certain behaviors, what makes us sort of tick, what makes us move. <laughs> so, so kind of movement disorder was, was uh, in, in that sense, uh, just interesting for me uh, also. And, uh, and there's a lot of overlap with uh, psychology and, and uh, behavior and uh, psychiatry. So uh, all these, you know, we call it movement disorders, but they, they are so much more uh, because uh, all these disorders I mentioned, especially Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, have behavioral manifestations as well. So uh, depression, anxiety are extremely common in Parkinson's disease. Um, irritability, depression, anger, frustration, very common in Huntington's disease. And, you know, these are just some examples. Uh, so to me, we are just kind of at the beginning of really understanding all these diseases and 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 uh, finding hopefully uh, better treatments or even cures for them. Uh, so I was always kind of I always knew I wanted to be at a place where I can continue exploring and and kind of help to uh, contribute to you know gaining new knowledge um, about diseases. Uh, so so it was a pretty natural uh, fit for me to look for a setting uh, where I can treat patients, but also be involved in in ongoing research efforts. Describe a typical week for you. Uh, so I have a setup. I'm the director of the Parkinson and Movement Clinic um, at the University of Louisville, and I'm in the fortunate position that part of my salary comes from an um, endowment that a, a, a patient in the past has uh, donated to the university. So that allows me to actually spend 50% of my time uh, with teaching and research. Uh, so I am involved in several um medication studies, so both for Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, so where we try new treatments. And these are studies that run are run from a central site and, you know, run at multiple sites throughout the U.S. and, and Europe. Uh, so that gives basically patients an opportunity to try new treatments or be involved in, in new treatment efforts. Um, and then we also uh, have some studies that uh, we have started or we are collaborating with some other centers. Uh, so we're currently looking at a study um, looking for treatment for anxiety, specifically for Parkinson's disease. Um, so that's kind of what I do when I don't see clinic patients. Uh, and uh, we are involved in teaching of medical student and uh, residents. Uh, I also do a lot of community outreach. Uh, so uh, three years ago, we have started a so-called Parkinson Buddy Program where we uh, team up uh, first-year medical students with Parkinson patients in the community. And it's an opportunity for uh, first-year medical students to really um, kind of experience how someone with Parkinson's lives and what challenges they face in their life. Uh, so it's for the academic year, they get paired up on a one-on-one -on -one basis with um, a patient and uh, they get some mentoring sessions with me but then the mainstay of a program is that they meet with the patient uh, in social settings and, you know, really kind of explore not only what, you know, what you usually see during a doctor's visit in the office for half an hour or so, 
but really experience them in their social setting. So I'm fairly involved in in um, teaching, community activities, et cetera, uh, fundraising activities for the community. Um, and then the other 50% of the time, uh, it's more traditional. Um, I see patients in the office, essentially. What percentage of your patients are actual movement disorder versus general neurology, if any? Um, I see 100% movement disorder patients um, in the outpatient setting. So the all all the uh, neurologists uh, in our group do um, alternate uh, call as well. So about one week every two to three months, I spend a week in the um, inpatient service and the general neurology service. So during that time, I supervise residents, and I would see all um, patients with uh, general neurology conditions like epilepsy, um, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. Uh, but all my outpatient time is spent with movement disorder patients. Do you feel like you have enough time for life outside of the hospital and work? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm married and have two children. We're two and four years old. Um, my, my work is fairly busy, so, <laughs> uh, depends who you ask how much, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think everyone with small children, it's always hard to, to, um, to pursue, um, like hobbies, et cetera. <laughs> I used to play piano, so I don't do that that much anymore. Uh, so I think my, my life outside of a hospital is mostly, mostly spent with my, with my children, my husband. What does the training path look like to become a movement disorder specialist? First of all, um, it's a neurology residency, and uh, that is usually one year of internship, so one year of internal medicine, and then three years of neurology. And um, uh, Movement Disorder Fellowship is actually not uh, an accredited fellowship, so uh, the pathways are a little bit more flexible. Uh, so there are fellowships which are one year uh, and are mostly clinical. Many fellowships are two years. and um, uh, basically, have one clinical, one research year, and uh, um, there's uh, also some additional um, opportunities to get specifically or very intensive training in uh, deep brain stimulation surgery. Uh, so, kind of, I mentioned that just in passing, but that's basically a, a surgical treatment for mostly Parkinson's disease and tremor, essential tremor, uh, as well as dystonia. And so the neurosurgeon obviously does a procedure, but then the neurologist or movement specialist would do the programming and, and sort of a follow-up care of a patient and kind of it's, it's a, sort of a teamwork. Uh, so some people elect to do a special fellowship training in, in that. Uh, so I personally actually did a, one year of a clinical fellowship in, in Boston at um, and uh, and then I elected. I was interested in, in getting more research training. I actually spent two years in a research fellowship at VNIH in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, uh, before I decided to look for a real job. <laughs> How competitive is it to get into a neuromuscular fellowship, even though they're they're not accredited? Well, I would say overall, we we actually have a um, a lack of neurologists. So there's definitely a shortage of neurologists and. Uh, um, it, it really depends, you know, some some programs are, are more competitive than others. But I think overall, it's uh, uh, fairly, um, you know, if you're a little bit flexible with your locations where you're willing to go, um, I think people really are, it's not extremely competitive to get into a fellowship. Again, I think uh, we're more in a situation where we actually need uh, more people to go in neurology and also go into movement disorders. Uh, like I said, one of the challenges is we are expecting almost like a epidemic of Parkinson's disease coming uh, coming upon us in the next uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, so uh, it's going to be challenging to maybe, because uh, probably the supply can't really meet the demand. So, you know, some alternative models that might be uh, probably more popular in the, in the years to come are models like telemedicine. Uh, it's also a popular model in, in rural areas, for example. So I'm practicing in Kentucky and we're already doing that uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but it's also a way to to sort of uh, meet uh, the on end. And um, again, uh, not you can't probably have a movement specialist in, in all the areas that would need one. So doing a sort of alternative practice models like telemedicine can be probably helpful in the future to to sort of keep up. Do you see any negative bias towards DOs in the field? 
Um, I wouldn't say so, no. Um, so I generally, uh, I think MDs and DOs are, are pretty um, equivalently treated, I would say, in neurology. Once you become a movement disorder specialist, are there any further opportunities to subspecialize? Um, so, yeah. So especially uh, people who are interested in uh, the surgical treatment options like deep brain stimulation surgery, uh, that does require uh, some you know, special training. It is usually part of the Movement Disorder Fellowship, but there's just some people who want to make this the main focus of their practice. And, and so that often uh, goes along with some additional training. And the, the movement disorder, or not the movement disorder, but the deep brain stimulation stuff, I know from, uh, from one of Allison's colleagues, sh- they go into the operating room during the placement of these deep brain uh, stimulators. Can you explain that procedure a little bit briefly? Sure. So, so basically the idea be, be, um, behind the deep brain stimulation surgery is uh, the patient gets like essentially a pacemaker for the brain or taking the example of tremor, they go either in the VAM and the thalamus or for Parkinson's and the uh, subthalamic uh, nucleus. So these electrodes get placed and uh, these areas uh, that we try to target are very, very small. Um, and so in order to um, make sure that the placement is correct, um, if the procedure is, is in most centers done in the awake state, which sounds initially very scary. <laughs> so the patient uh, just gets some anesthesia while the initial you know, skull um, hole is made. But then when the electrode is advanced, um, we actually uh, want the patient awake. And uh, we listen, so there's a um, mapping done that we actually listen to the cells as the electrode is advanced. And uh, that's kind of where the extra training uh, plays in uh, because cells in different parts of the basal ganglia have all characteristic sounds. Uh, So someone uh, who has very uh, trained ears in this can really tell you where we are in the brain as the electrode gets advanced. And then that's kind of part in determining where the best uh, location for these electrodes is. Uh, So imaging has kind of a a more and more important role, obviously, in helping as well with uh, the correct localization. But most centers currently still do the microelectrode recording um, as additional means of finding the right location for these electrodes. And it's it's the neurologist in the room guiding the neurosurgeon or letting him or her know where they are. So it's really kind of a teamwork uh, effort. So we have a neurosurgeon. We often have a neuro um, electrophysiologist in there as well. And then the neurologist um, helps with uh, listening to the cells and also doing testing on the patient. So we want to ideally, when we are in the right spot, we actually turn the DBS, uh, the stimulation briefly on and are looking, well, does the tremor actually get better? Does the rigidity get better? So that's kind of a way to, in the OR, often uh, seeing an immediate effect um, confirming that the um, the space is the correct one where we want the electrode placed. That's really cool. I think it's, it's such a unique type of surgery. It absolutely is. And I think everyone who's seen this or especially has seen a patient, you know, getting better. I mean, it is, uh, I think I heard someone say it's one of these closest miracles you can come in medicine. And I've seen patients who had, I mean, severe tremor and they couldn't uh, hand write at all. They basically couldn't eat without completely spilling, you know, water over themselves. And after the surgery, uh, the tremor was essentially gone. Uh, So, you know, a we can't always guarantee that dramatic of an outcome, but for many patients, it is really a miracle surgery. So it's it's very interesting and very satisfying to um, treat patients like that. For the primary care doc that's listening to this, whether they go into internal medicine or family practice or even pediatrics, what do you wish they knew about movement disorders to help help patients do better? <laughs> Well, I think the main thing to keep in mind is definitely not be afraid of referring a patient to a neurologist or movement specialist, uh, because I think what happens, and especially because Parkinson's and essential tremor are so common, I think sometimes um, 
internists or uh, primary care physicians are actually the main uh, providers uh, treating patients, which oftentimes works out just fine. Uh, but I think um, I think it's important for people without special training to to realize limitations and then the treatment, you know, kind of a first time treatment doesn't uh, go so well, and you know, people still have their tremor. Really, not hesitate of referring them because for in many cases we really have very effective treatments which can make a huge difference. Uh, and even for people in more advanced stages, uh, treatments like with deep brain stimulation surgery may may be um, um, an option. So so yeah, don't, don't hesitate asking for help uh, for someone with Parkinson's disease or tremor and, and we can often make a big difference. What other specialties do you work the closest with? So we often are uh, in very close uh, teams with psychology, uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. Uh, and so many centers ha- run actually special multidisciplinary clinics. Uh, so not on a daily basis, but maybe a monthly clinic for uh, Parkinson's um, or we have a monthly clinic for Huntington's disease, where people can see multiple uh, specialists. So in our case, it's usually psychiatrists, psychologists at the same time. And that really is helpful in facilitating care for the patient, sort of streamlining care. And it's also helpful for, for us to get imp- input from multiple specialties to uh, serve a patient best and, and kind of work all together. So, so yeah, so that's uh, basically um, uh, sort of uh, social workers are in our clinic as well. So we're very lucky to have a, a, a social worker uh, because um, um, it's very important to pay attention to how movement disorders affect someone's work, someone's social life. And uh, in later stages, uh, needing um, assistance, maybe moving to a assisted uh, living or nursing home is, is necessary for many patients with uh, maybe affected by dementia and later stages of Parkinson's. So it's very helpful to have a social worker as well. Are there any special opportunities outside of clinical medicine for movement disorder specialists? Well, I think uh, um, in most uh, neurology subspecialties, there's uh, certainly, uh, as I already mentioned, research is uh, uh, really uh, booming and uh, many, many aspects of research. So I think some uh, some neurologists and movement specialists uh, decide to pursue a full-time research career and might uh, join uh, industry or uh, uh, kind of uh, basically do research as a, as a full-time career. Um, and then I guess the other two main options really are private practice or, or working in academia. I think other, I mean, other paths would be more unusual to I don't know, work for um, uh, like a industry uh, completely, but um, certainly, you know, I mean, <laughs> I think it's, it's an interesting thing just being in medicine in general and being, being a physician and getting expert knowledge. I mean, you can really forge your own uh, path and find your niche and, uh, and uh, you know, your career can certainly change multiple times throughout your life. And, and so that makes it really uh, interesting, I think. What do you know now that you wish you knew before going into movement disorder? Um, I mean, I, I think I haven't been, I haven't had sort of a, a moment of uh, regret or, or uh, um, sort of, you know, too much uh, surprise. I think uh, experiences during residency are a pretty good uh, uh, preparation on on what what you sort of expect uh, later on in real life. You know, I think for all physicians, I mean, there are so many changes in medicine, and, and you've probably heard this before in your show. I mean, most physicians complain about, you know, paperwork, <laughs> um, kind of documentation, insurance hassles, kind of being uh, burdensome and, and taking up too much time. So, so probably every physician will, will, will sort of tell you that, but that was maybe something that as a medical student, you know, you don't really see that side because no one will give you or tell you that in, in anatomy class that uh, you're going to spend a lot of time, you know, on the phone trying to get your med- patient's medication approved because this insurance decided not to approve it. So, you know, that's kind of a, a hidden uh, truth right now that 
uh, physicians are maybe not as autonomous as we, as we would like to be because oftentimes insurances mandate which medications we can prescribe. Uh, but there are definitely uh, pushbacks, I think, from, from physicians and the American Academy of Neurology is doing a, a really good job of trying to advocate on our behalf. And uh, I'm actually about to go to a annual um, advocacy event in DC uh, where they invite neurologists from every state to really meet the lawmakers and make our interests known. So, so yeah, I don't think any uh, had any sort of real surprises from just, um, you know, the real, the neurologic side of things. I think the, main sort of adaption from being a training and then being out in real practice is how do you kind of deal with the whole business side of medicine? What do you like the most about your job? I really um, love my job. <laughs> I, I do really like working in a setting where I can uh, see patients, but then uh, interact with trainees, uh, do teaching uh, and, uh, and uh, do research. I think I wouldn't want to give up um, any aspect of the free. And, you know, sometimes it's challenging because our days all just have 24 hours. Uh, so it's it's challenging to, to find uh, uh, time and kind of find the balance between uh, doing all the different things we do. But uh, I think in the end, it's, it's worth it. And, and uh, kind of having a success in one area, you know, kind of sometimes compensate for another disappointment, maybe. And uh, I just kind of think it, it balances things out when you don't just do one thing all the time. What do you like the least? Well, I think really it comes back to, uh, to more of the regulatory burdens and dealing with insurances. I think no one really likes uh, having to do these peer-to-peer -peer review phone calls for getting things approved. So, so I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that uh, in the coming years, uh, physicians will regain a little bit of autonomy. And, and um, I, I'm pretty fortunate because I do have very good support staff and great support staff who do a lot of it paperwork for me. But yeah, if I could cut down a little bit more on, on these aspects of my job, that would probably be my, my wish. Do you see any major changes coming to the movement disorder field, whether it's new treatments, new medications, new devices? So yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely um, developments or developments in, in multiple areas. So I think, um, uh, well, we touched already a little bit on the, the deep brain simulation surgery, and, and that's uh, there's more companies now on the market, and you know competition is always good because they all come up with new ideas, and uh, uh, you know there's new options now to deliver the treatment uh, directionally, and uh, so so lots of uh, kind of uh, maybe uh, feeding loops where we would not just give the stimulation uh, regardless of, um, you know, the individual patient, but actually have sort of a feedback loop. Uh, so, and, and the, where the stimulation would be more individualized. So definitely lots of technical developments. Um, and I think another really interesting area is certainly uh, genetics. And uh, as in other areas, I mean, the ability to do genetic testing has just kind of in the last 10 years, I mean, just kind of skyrocketed. And, you know, we can now do a whole genome sequencing for maybe five thousand dollars or so. So versus years years ago, that was you know essentially unthinkable to to do that. Uh, so I think there's going to be many more um, discoveries and insights, and in not only sort of monogenetic diseases like Huntington's disease, right? You just look for a single gene um, abnormality. But really, um, I, th I think we're going to really learn much more about the interplay of environment and uh, genetic factors and how that impacts more complex disorders like Parkinson's disease, but also other movement disorders, and uh, hopefully learn more how we can intervene and, and really make differences in, in uh, different ways. If you had to do it all over again, would you still be a movement disorder specialist? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I really think um, there's um, not really any other job I would uh, I would prefer. For the student who may be interested in movement disorder, maybe general neurology, any last words of wisdom for them for checking something out to get involved, to get some experience? 
Well, so yeah, I think I would definitely uh, encourage students to uh, to do an elective in neurology. And uh, there's also lots of opportunities to get engaged in research. So I often have students working with me during the summer break. Uh, so at University of Louisville, they, they have sort of a scholarship to work for six months with a, a researcher during the summer and you know probably many uh, places have a, a similar program so that's a that's a good a good opportunity to just you know have some hands-on experience uh do maybe a little research project but also see someone in their day-to-day work you know get some patient contact and see if that's maybe um, an area of interest all right there you have it again that was dr Catherine lefever talking about movement disorders as a subspecialty of neurology. If you think you're interested in movement disorder and the diseases and patients that a movement disorder specialist would treat, check into it and see if it is right for you. Hope you have a great week. Don't forget to check us out next week here on Specialty Stories. Don't forget to subscribe so you get these podcasts every week on your device of choice. And one last request, go tell a friend about the podcast. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.